so <laughs> thrilled to be talking to you, and I really mean that. Thank so, you, Glenn. what I would love I to can't know. Actually, believe what I'm sitting here talking to you. So there you <laughs> go. Know. It goes both ways. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, how did you how did you end up, or what brought you to uh, Star is Born? I think a long road, you know, I think the 50 year road is what brought me to it. You know, I mean, I'd never met Bradley Cooper before. Um, I was in the middle of a job. We had reps telling us that we should get together and Bradley wanted to meet with me and we could never come together, but I ended up going to his home and sat with him for a couple of hours and during that time he played the tape for me of which he'd been working with a voice coach whose name I've totally forgotten I'm sorry to say but he'd been working with him for a couple of months and he says this is probably going to sound a little strange to you but I want you to hear something and he turned this thing on and it sounded very much like me working with his voice coach so he'd committed to my voice Wow! before I was set for the part which was kind of strange. So he had always thought of you as yeah, his and we, and brother. We, we really just, during that two hours, talked about family. We talked about our moms. and We talked about his vision for the film. and We talked about the brother relationship. And that's really what most of it all hinged on. Yeah. It, it was, you know, it was... It, I remember Bradley telling me, in the driveway, if you trust me, you'll be glad you did it. Because we didn't know what, we, we, neither one of us really knew what Bobby's was going to be. Mm -hmm. Certainly, you know, was an integral part and an important part, but not a big part. But I remember Bradley specifically, and we've talked a lot about it in Q&As since then. That if I would trust him, that I'd be happy I did it. And he was right. It was the right thing to do. The thing that I that I was very moved by when I saw it was even the fact that you don't have that many scenes together, you mm. get a great sense of history yeah. between the two of those characters. Yeah. And and. I think it. I think yeah. it was born in that first encounter. Yeah. You know? The first scene, the the fight that we had in the beginning, it was my first day of work, <laughs> of course. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And it was a, a tough setup, and it went long, and the scene was longer, and they were right there in close. So, but it was a lovely way to start, and it, it there was a lot of history to it, although there wasn't a lot of time. So, I mean, there, there was this quote from, I think, Stanislavski or one of those guys about there are no small parts, yeah. only small actors. Right. I'm never sure what that meant. About I mean <laughs> I know it was no small parts, but it, was he talking about an actor's stature? Or, I think or I, the I think of any a great actor or, can fill out a small part yeah. and make it uh, important yeah. and resonant in the film, which is something that you certainly do. Yeah. You really do. Thank you. One of the images that stays with me is your the, the last close-up with of your eyes. Yeah. It's very, very, yeah. very moving. It's the same story. Told over and over. Forever. All any artist can offer the world is how they see those 12 notes. That's it. But what did attract you to it? The wife. What attracted me to the wife was it was new territory for mm. me. I'd never played a character like that before. Um, and also I, I, I was attracted by the questions that I had and I, that I didn't know if I could answer or not. And so I went in kind of liking the, the idea, mm -hmm. um, but I had to answer the big question that I had to answer for myself was why she didn't just leave. And because I was so afraid that every woman who saw it would just say, oh, come on, just leave him. But it, it, it's much, much more complex than that. And in answering that question, 
um, I really felt I, I, I came to a place where I understood her and understood what she's angry about, about herself, not mm -hmm. just about mm -hmm. her husband. Because she's basically been complicit in getting what she wants, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. um, until she can't deal with it anymore. But it was, it was fascinating. It was, it was challenging. Okay. It really was. It was I can only imagine. It was yeah. challenging. So I asked for, you know, I asked for a challenge and I got one. Yeah. <laughs> but we had I, Bjorn Runga, our director. The thing that really was wonderful about it is he, he trusted close-ups. Yeah. And he knew how to light them. And he knew where to put the camera. So as an actor, you didn't have to worry about that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You knew that whatever you were doing was getting on film. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if in, in your experience, but certainly in mine, I've, I've, I've had terrible disappointments because... You uh, knew that it was there and it wasn't there. It's not, see yes, it. it's yeah. not on film. I understand. Because it's either an angle that yeah. was just, or the light that... Yeah. And um, that was very freeing because he got it. He, and he knew, and he had a wonderful... DP Ulf Brantis, who worked, they'd worked together for a long time. And so that was, it was, it was, uh, in that, in that situation, you could just, you didn't have to worry about the camera. You just could trust it. And that's huge. Yeah. Worry about all the other stuff. Yeah. <laughs> the only stuff, the stuff you can control. <laughs> yeah. Or try to. Yeah. So, um. I thought it was, I just, when you said, most women would have thought, why don't you just leave them? It's like, I thought there was such reality in that yeah. back and forth and back and forth. Yeah. And he wanted her to. Been together for a I long time. He wanted her to, but he, and he understood too. Yeah. But the last. But the moment, the revelation in, in that whole period where you really understand. Yeah. The it thing, one of the hardest um, scenes for me, I mean, there were several scenes I found difficult, but yeah, I'm sure. the, the one at the, where he's dying and he says, do you love me? Yeah. And that was so upsetting to me that I stopped. Do, do we have to have that line? Does he have to ask me that yeah. question as he's dying? Yeah, it seemed, <laughs> That's not it seemed, fair. It seemed, it, kind of seemed, it seemed a strange time. <laughs> yeah, because of course she does, but she just said she's going to leave him. Yeah. But it's more about him. And that's what breaks my heart about that character because he didn't ever think he was worthy of love. Yeah. And and yeah. I don't think he ever, because he felt that he wasn't didn't have her gift. Yeah. And and um, so at the very end he says, "Do you love me?" As if have, you know. And I don't know if you really because I don't love myself. Yeah. I'm a disappointment to myself. Yeah. You know, way down underneath. Yeah. So it was really. That's what I loved about that story. It was uh, it was grown up and it was realistic and it was complex. I can't do it, I can't take it, I can't take the humiliation of holding your coat and arranging your pills and being shoved aside with all the other wives to talk about some goddamn shopping trip while you, while you say to all the, the gathering sycophants that your wife doesn't write. I just had a, a lovely experience with a group of women. You're braver than I am. Gaga was there. <laughs> I was so, she, she, I could tell she was right next to me. I could tell she was really nervous. Um, and. New what, waters. What? New waters. Yeah, new, and, but uh, how brave. Yeah. How brave. Um, and what was it like? Do, you do, know, I, th I think when you come from, and I may be wrong, it, I've always had a great fascination for female singers for some reason. And I think it's because I started singing in choral groups when I was a kid, like four years old, in the Congregational Church in Sacramento, to be yeah. exact. My mom took me there to sing in the Cherub Choir. But I've always threw out, always been involved in choral groups, and I always was fascinated by the female singers rather than the men rather than the boys. That said, I think, I don't even know why I got off on that tangent. Is it because of their, the, the quality of their voices? It's, or? It, it is, it's a different thing. Mm -hmm. It's just mm -hmm. a different thing. Maybe I just like women better than men, period. <laughs> you know, I don't know, but it's yeah. it's just, 
what comes out of a woman singing to me is much more interesting than a man, mm -hmm. you know. Nothing against you guys. Um, I think on some level that being such a huge star worldwide in the music trade, that she just had to be, how could you go and sing in front of those big audiences all over the world, do what she does and as a musician and as a, as a singer and as a performer and not be comfortable in front of that thing, mm. you know? And I, I think could see how that could happen. Do you? Because the camera looks into your soul. Yeah. If she has a close-up. Yeah. And in a concert, unless they're... It's pretty big. They filmed. don't get a close-up. Yeah. That's I mean, sometimes sure. now the concerts, they can zing well, in on you, but... So much for that theory. No, no. When did she was... <laughs> <laughs> but what was it like on the set with her? How? What? She what? was incredible. Yeah? She was incredible. I mean, I, we went to the table read. Mm-hmm. A bigger table read than I'd buy uh, double the size, triple the size of any ever head of the studios at the table read. Oh, that's a little intimidating. There was music played and song, people bursting out in song, meaning Gaga. Wow. I knew her only from afar, as I know you only from afar, and I've loved you from afar, and I've loved her from afar. And to see that she was just this kind of regular girl on some level, as Stephanie. Yeah. You know, never regular by any means, probably today, but. Did you call her Stephanie? I or, did. Or, yeah. I did. Did she ask you to, or just that? No, I settled on it. Yeah. That's cool. And she was Stephanie. Yeah. I mean, she was, a, she was stunning to work with. Yeah. There was a moment where we all were at the Greek theater. I wasn't there for many of the live venues that we did, but we were there at the Greek theater. and It was all little, you know, were her, there were little monsters, her, her fan base that follows her so religiously. They, they were the extras in the crowd. And as you know, sitting around all day is not a great thing for extras <laughs> at times. And, there was a moment late at night. We'd been there a long time. And everybody was kind of restless. We shot through the day, and they'd been in the sun all day, and now it was kind of turning cold. And she just came out of nowhere and sat down at the piano and started singing and just rocked the place. Everybody just pretty much stopped. The crew stopped. Everybody was just, you know, magical. So and I think she too, and I know for a fact, because I've sat again through Q&As with both of them, that it was that trust issue for her. She trusted Bradley implicitly like I did. And what I just was think it like working it's easy with Bradley to get, get on his to first the truth. We want to get yeah. to the truth. Yeah, right. You have to trust somebody in order to get to the truth, whether it's making films or building a relationship. Mm -hmm. If the trust isn't there, then... Yeah, it, I agree. It complicates it anyway. I think we had a better band name, we might have made it. Or maybe it's because we look like a father and son duo. <laughs> Not many of those around. The thing that's crazy about what what we do in our profession is that we can get on to the set for the first day of a of a movie and mm. you have to trust when you think about it i mean yeah. you have to trust yep. you have to trust that it's okay to look into somebody's eyes yep. that they can take that you know yep. and that that um and and you can give it back it really is 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 I, I think it's hard for people to realize that and how f fragile you can feel at times and how naked you can feel at times. Um, and when you have that, it seems like, it sounds like that's what Bradley built on his set. It was incredible. Then you, you the have The tone it. that he set, and I think that he did with everybody. It was like he was the muse to everyone. Yeah. Crew and cast. Wow. Everybody just, you know, I mean... He'd put this thing together. It was, you know, it came to him via Eastwood at one time, and 
he felt he was too young to play this over-the-hill rock star, which he was. Mm -hmm. I would trust him at that. And then a couple of years later, and he, you know, he saw Stephanie somewhere at some cancer event, and she was she sang La Vie en Rose, and he just thought, "You saw, you saw the I'm story. I'm going to give it a shot." Yeah, and it all just fell into place. It's just astounding. So, do you think he'll go on to be? Oh, I think he's got. Yeah, I think he's been on that road for a long time. Yeah from when he was doing television when he first got into the business and then the, the films. I, I know they spent lots of time talking to directors and lots of time in the editing room. And right. I don't think he was interested far beyond being an actor. Yeah. Bradley's brilliant. You know, I mean, he's clearly a brilliant guy and he's a brilliant filmmaker at the same time. So, That's so And thrilling. he's a sweet man. Yeah. He's a nice, nice man. He's a gentleman. He's a good boy. You know. I want to know where you started. I mean, I know where you started in film, I believe, with Garp. Yes. Yes. But when did you start acting? As 1974. An actor? I had graduated from college. I had done uh, two national auditions, and from that got hired as an understudy, and to play small parts in a three-play series that the Phoenix Theater was doing on Broadway in 1974 in the old Helen Hayes Theater. Wow. So I, I went that fall to New York. And... Uh, but did you, had you done it in school? Had yes, I did. I went to William & Mary. They throughout. had a great theater department at the time mm -hmm. with, with a triumvirate of wonderful professors and the head of the of the theater department, Howard Scammon, really understood my seriousness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and he was great. He came up to me once and he said, just remember, it's like my senior year and I'd done a lot of theater and stuff. Right. He said, just remember, you're a big fish in a really little pond. <laughs> <laughs> so that. my first thought when I got to New York is, oh, now I'm a little fish in a really yeah. big pond. Yeah. Um, but it really set me up. I mean, uh, I, uh, I'm sure. Yeah, I got to do all kinds of things and uh, theater. I mean, for me, it was that was my home, and I started there for six years before I did my first movie. Yeah. George Roy Hill. George Roy Hill. I feel like you should have been in one. You were. What? Did you? Did you ever? Were you in ever a, a movie that George directed? I, 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 I auditioned for him one time for Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. Oh my God. Which is bizarre. <laughs> I ended up being a, a fly on the wall. I was literally, I was a contract player at Fox then, oh. where they shot the film. Wow. And I auditioned for a part. Wow. Didn't get the part. A guy named Donnelly Rhodes got the part. <laughs> you remember his name? I do. He's passed away now, but I remember him well. He was well, nice you've man. outlived him. <laughs> he was a nice man. I did outlive him. Yeah. George. George was an interesting cat. George. I he guess, gave my wife fits while they were on that film. He wasn't necessarily what, why did she, did he give her, well, we, he wasn't, he didn't coddle you. No. No, if you needed and I that, liked that about him. Yeah. If you needed that, then you it didn't was get a hard it. game. Uh, I remember I went up to him and said, I, I hear it's really hard some, for some people to make this transition from theater to stage. Um, and he said, yep. That was it. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> wow. Yeah. But he took good care of me. I, I, I thought that my first film, it would be either the back of my head or on yeah. somebody else's face as I was talking. I had no concept of what it would be like. What a start. Yeah. I don't want to be thought of as the long-suffering wife. <laughs> you understand that, don't you? No, 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 no. I have to thank you. Everyone thanks their wife. If I don't, I'll come off like some narcissistic bastard. But you are. <laughs> God. Catherine was going to the, with the cinematographer. I'm going to tell this story about why he gave her fits. Why? Catherine was going with the DP on Butch Cassidy. Yeah. Conrad and Hall. And George didn't like that. They'd okay. been together for a long time. They had this sequence in which there was like six cameras set up and Conrad put Catherine on one of them to operate it. 
and George saw her on this camera or knew that she had been on the camera and he banned her from the set. <laughs> Truly. I have a great And it really story. just soured it for a long, oh, long that's while, too I bad. believe. It is too bad. And when I was Sorry doing Garp. Sorry about that, Catherine. I hope you'll forgive me for. When I was doing Garp, I was rehearsing that speech where she's talking about how she conceived Garp. Mm -hmm. And I was working on it, working on it, and I just couldn't get it. The rhythms were kind of off, and the word, you know, the unexpected word in the wrong place. And I finally went up to George. It was uh, Steve Tessich who had written it. And I said, Can I? Can I talk to Steve about the speech? Because I'm, I'm having a hard time and maybe he could make a couple of changes. And this kind of strange look went over George's face. And I said, yeah, yeah, you go to Steve. Talk to Steve about it. And I went up to Tessish and I said, you know, I can, can you help me a little bit with this? You know, can we go through it? And I'm having a hard time. And, and Steve looked at me and said, that's the one, the one speech that George wrote. <laughs> oh, no. Yes. I love that. <laughs> How about Robin? Oh, Robin. Wow. Robin and Garp, he and uh, Chris Reaver at their wildest. They had, they had become so famous. Mm -hmm. Robin had been, um, you know, in uh, Mork. He was Mork. And then yep. he had done one movie. He had done Popeye. Right. With the Altman, I think. Yep. And George got him. And um, I was, it was, we rehearsed that movie like a play. We went up to Columbia. Very luxury. Yep, with tape on the floor, oh, and we had to know our lines. And I remember how generous it was, actually, because a lot of directors don't don't care this much. If you, he really worked with Robin about the little ticks and things that he had gotten mm -hmm. in the habit of doing from playing Garp, and he's mm -hmm. and he's and he'd be working on a speech. He said, "No, hear it. You did it. Do it again. Oh, there it is. Do it again." Wow. And, and it was such a generous, and wow. George told me uh, of a habit, two mannerisms that I have um, that still I would do and not be aware of if it wasn't for him um, picking them up when, you know, on my first movie. And, and, and it was wonderful the way he was with Robin. He was incredibly patient and generous. Mm -hmm. And Robin, um, he worked hard, and he had that great gift of making people laugh when they needed to. Right. You know, he never, yeah. never was a fan. Um, the first scene I ever did on film was a tracking shot, with me and with a, some groceries and Robin, and we passed by Susie Kurtz, who's the prostitute. Right. And w then we go back, and I had, I was miked. I had never had, I, uh, I was, Terror was right up here. And then over there were all his fans screaming for him. So it was in the, at night, and I think, in the East Village in New York. And we started off, and I said, I can't believe I have to walk and talk and stop in a mark and start again and talk some more. And, you know, it just was, it just seemed impossible to me. And, and Rob, Robin was so wonderful right. uh, he I think he sensed my fear but also you know you want to talk louder because he used to you're used to yep. projecting from a stage you know, from, you know yeah so it was an amazing way to begin that he said if I sometimes when if I was really saying something sincerely I say you know that you really are a lovely man and I you know and it's like the slow shake of the head and then also he said I could do a slow blink sometimes <laughs> <laughs> that was it. <laughs> and I, the master of yeah. slow banking and uh, mm, funny. <laughs> but I, and I'm aware and of it. And he broke you of it. He did. Or, or he made you aware of it. Made me aware of it. Yeah. yeah. Can't say that I. So when you do it, do you think of him every time? Yes, yeah, I do. Of course. I do. Yeah. I thought it was a, because you've seen people, I've seen people, I've worked in actor, I had this mannerism of going like this through his hair. And I guess nobody ever told him, you know, you do that in every part. I yeah. know and maybe you choose to, but right. maybe you didn't, don't want to. Right. Well, that's, you know. And how, what was your first film? Did you, did you, have you ever done theater? No. Oh my God, you've as, been great. As, as, a, as a student, I didn't go to any kind of school? theatrical <laughs> school, but 
in high school. I started, you know, I did musical comedies when I was in grade school and middle school and high school. What musical comedies? Guys and Dolls, that kind of stuff, you know. Not Sky that that's Mas- a musical comedy, yeah. but, you know. That's cool. So you had it in your in the, blood. The drama was always, I did Death Takes a Holiday when I was a senior in high school. Wow. You know. And, just, and then how did you get into... I, I just, I, I went to too many films when I was a kid. I had no illusions that I was going to be an actor, like a great actor, theatrical actor. I wanted to do films. I went to a place in Sacramento called the Sequoia Theater every Saturday and watched the matinee. And what was a film that you remember having a big... Influence oh, on you. God, I can remember a couple of Gary Cooper films, mm. you know, Sergeant York, seeing that over and over as a child, you. and, you know, made me weep every time I saw it. And, mm-hmm. You know, The Creature from Black Lagoon was very powerful to me in some way, some oddball way. Mm-hmm. You know, couldn't figure out how that guy could do that. How did that guy swim around underwater all that time? And, you know, entertain me. Did you like uh, Jimmy Stewart? Yeah, I loved Jimmy Stewart. Yeah. I got I was... to work with Stewart one time. Oh, you did? Yeah, right at the end of his career on a show called Hawkins for the defense. He was playing a defense attorney, a television series. Oh, wow. The old MGM Studios, Sony Studios now. How old was he then? Oh, God, he was in his 80s, I believe. Wow, I never knew he did a TV series. Yeah, I, I wasn't in it. I was played a, I was a prosecuting attorney. Mm-hmm. It was like a guest star. Mm-hmm. Ah. And I don't think it went very long. Hawkins. It's tiring. I think it was just, probably yeah. tired him out. But it was wonderful. And I learned, you know, from him. I, really, I was very fortunate to work with some, you know, we worked with William Holden. Oh. You know. And then there was a bunch of cowboy guys that I worked with, Ben Johnson and Slim oh Pickens and all those guys. And right at the end of the, that time for all those people. And just, I've always felt blessed by it. So you've done a lot of Westerns? Yeah. I kind of got boxed into that. And there was a time where I thought, well, am I ever going to be thought of <laughs> as something else other than the cowboy? I have a very, very big, soft place in my heart for Westerns because I grew up being Hopalong Cassidy's sidekick, Lucky. Um, My sister Tina was Hopalong, but I was Lucky, and we watched Hopalong Cassidy. I loved him because I thought, how cool that he's the good guy in a black shirt and a black hat. Then somebody told me that it's black and white television, and actually it's a navy blue shirt. (laughs) (laughs) Boys. But I love, I mean, no, it's so deeply American. Yeah. I'd give my eye tooth to be in a Western. You'd fare well in that genre, I would Yeah, think. I would love to do yeah. that.